ಮೂರ್ಧಸ ಭಗವಥೋರಹಥ ಸಂಸ ನ ಮೂರ್ಧಸ ಭಗವಥೋರಹಥ ಸಂಸ ನ ಮೂರ್ಧಸ ಭಗವಥೋರಹಥ ಸಂಸ ಭೂತಾಂಗ ಸಂಖಿ the worldly dhammas when we attach to them then our life becomes a, just a series of kind of sometimes confused and disconnected events living a, a life just based on sensual pleasure and and habitual reactions to the sensory world of course leaves us with this sense of somehow things are isolated disconnected unrelated and of course as you get older you begin to begin to get quite depressing because it seems like there's no meaning or purpose to any of it what at one time seemed quite attractive and alluring to us becomes boring as we experience those things over and over and over we get weary every sensual experience if repeated uh, enough times becomes wearisome becomes bored despairing in regards to it there's a much hope expectation in our lives was finding some kind of happiness finding somebody who will make us happy who will fulfill us or finding a some uh, a profession or something in the world during this lifetime that will be truly fulfilling and even if we do find if we get everything we want we still experience this sense of of something incomplete you know, feeling of alienation of doubt and worry fear haunt us throughout our lifetime life becomes just an endless series of worries because the future is unknown and and we tend to relate to that always through worrying about being deprived of something not not passing the examination not being able to pay the bills not getting what we want except being having losing our loved ones uh, losing our health old age arthritis uh decaying teeth falling hair wrinkles crow's feet around the eyes losing one's figure worries about just the foolish things on that level or worries about worries about big things not being able to to make enough to support one's family so worry is a great problem with most people and there is a lot to worry about on the worldly plane isn't there it's nothing but worries really as long as one attaches and identifies with the worldly conditions the sensory the sensory world then our life is merely a worry it's all it can ever be because is always uh, the possibility of some terrible thing happening to us of being left alone of being unwanted of being humiliated rejected of, of not having uh, uh, 
any money, not having material security. Worry, worry all the time. And one becomes so habituated to worrying that even when there's nothing to worry about, one worries. This becomes a, a habit of mind, even when everything is all right. Nothing's wrong, nothing to really worry about at the present time because one doesn't know how to do anything else, one worries about, well, it can't last, it won't last, I know it'll go, probably tomorrow something terrible will happen. <laughs> and then off we go again into the stream of worry, fear, anxiety, our common human problems. If you're really attached to some other person, there's always the fear. What if they die? What if they leave? What if they... What if I'm separated from them? So even when you found someone you really love, love to be with, along with that goes the worry of the separation. The attachment, the attraction, and all this bring its opposite into our lives. Whatever you're attached to, whatever you're attracted to, you'll, you'll feel uh, fear about losing, of not having it, or it changes, or it disappoints. Now this is just the way the sensual world is. It's, if you contemplate it, like we've been doing, contemplating the sensual world during this past month. Just noting how it operates how it works as we experience it. Whatever we attach to, we, we're going, and how good its quality might be and desirable it might be, it brings along with it its opposite. So expectation and hope bring despair into our lives. Birth brings death. Health brings disease. Attachment to love brings hate. So that this is this this is just to, to be noted that that you can't have one without the other. You can't have birth without death. You can't have an inhalation without an exhalation. You can't have uh, the arising without its cessation. So hope and despair are a team, they work together. Just like the inhalation the, would like the hope, inspiration, and then despair, the exhalation. Disappointment. I've just noticed this on just little things in as you reflect and contemplate your own mind, that which exists for you, you, you become increasingly aware of just how just little tiny attachments, seemingly neutral and harmless things, bring, a certain, uh, bring the, their opposite. Just wanting to, to hold on to, to a, a beautiful scene just a little while longer brings along a feeling of, of uh, a negative feeling, of having, not having to separate from it not wanting to separate. When you're really enjoying somebody's company and then, and then they have to go, there's a feeling of not wanting them to go, not wanting to experience that separation. I used to find myself kind of hanging on. The people I like were starting to look at signs where they wanted to leave. I'd start getting asking any old question at all just to keep the, to delay the separation from happening. On a telephone, you know, to, some people trying to, trying to get off the line with some people are really difficult. If they hang on, you say, well, um, and then, well, I've got to be going now, and then, then something else comes up. <laughs> Thank you.
And we like to say, see you again, other than goodbye forever. Maybe we'll never meet again. Now this works, this, this is just, not, this is natural. It's uh, the attraction and uh, repulsion in nature. Coming together, separating. These are the natural laws of conditioned phenomena. And to know this is a contemplation of Dhamma. To see this in our human state where we can reflect on it. Just giving things a second glance, the karmic result is the lingering, the desire to linger, creates karma, which will we we have to we have to experience, we have to come to terms with eventually. So the more you you linger and put off and procrastinate and and hang on to things, then your life will be a series of rather depressing states and uh, and. Uh, doubts and uncertainties, a rather nebulous uh, web of uncertainties and insecurities is what many, what people's lives can be. Just a cloud of things half done, of never, never fully resolved situations or relationships or conditions. The things just kind of half done, never quite relinquished, never quite let go of, never quite uh, given up, just hanging on, not not terribly tightly, not just in desperation, but more or less out of just uh, confusion, uncertainty, fear of letting go, of letting go of everything. The fear that maybe if you let go of everything there'll be nothing. So fear uh, haunts our lives that we'll be left with nothing at all. Nothing left. That, that sense of not having anything, not being anybody, not having any, any, any security at all. The unknown and yet the death of our bodies imply that we, we don't know what will happen we'd like to have guarantees wouldn't we that when we die we go to heaven or we go some to some nice place hopefully and there's a fear that because we've done some rather unskillful things in our lives we might go to the other one to spend a good time in the kind of being purged from paying off our debt you know, all the evil things we've thought or done or said and then there's the hope that maybe it just ends with just oblivion like a sleep you just conk out and then that's it it would be nice too and it just to not have to exist anymore not have to suffer any more pain not have to go through purgatory or hell or uh, that some people prefer that to the one where you live in a state of eternal happiness. But death is the mystery that we that we must that we will only comprehend when the body dies. So we reflect on life as we're living it. This is our opportunity to contemplate existence while things exist, while we're in this state of separation, of sensory experience of birth from this, from the, this vehicle of the body during its span, its lifespan, from birth to death. It, is how I see it now it is the occasion to contemplate, to reflect, to learn, and to free oneself from any misconceptions, any wrong views about it. Now that the, we've explored the mind quite thoroughly during this retreat, so that you're very much aware that in the morning and evening reflections that I've been giving, 
and kept pointing over and over and over to the way it is. This is the way it is for all of us, not the, not just, I assume, that, I mean, the things I've been pointing to haven't been personal. I've not been talking about my, the subjective uh, conditions that I'm experiencing, but about what is common to us all, like the silence of the mind, the roaring sound of silence, the breath of the body, the posture of the body, the feeling of the body, the time is now, the place is here. This is, this is common to all of us, this is the way it is. A reflection, so that we have this to acknowledge and recognize, um, the way it happens to be, and then we can begin to observe that which we create onto it. Now this is most important for you to observe the world you create onto the way it is. The world as it is, is just this way. And it's, it's not any creation from our mind, it's just the way it is. And we call it suchness. As isness. It's just this way. But then if we're heedless, unenlightened, unawakened human beings, we create something onto the way it is. Such as it is, we create a self, personalities, problems. All kinds of complexities can be, can be spewed forth from our fertile minds to produce all kinds of strange monsters and foolish things and even intelligent, clever bits and pieces that manage to to get thrown out into the moments, the here and now. But as you're developing the path more and more, you, you stop, you no longer seek to just distract yourself, endlessly creating things with your mind, out of fear and desire and the force of habit. You begin to open the mind, note the way it is. And that's a cool, calm position of knowing it's not excited or stupid or or frightened kind of thing. It's a, it's the coolness, the balance, the stillness. Truly, in, true intelligence, cool intelligence, not not just clever uh, manipulation of thought, but true clear mindedness. A Buddha mind is a cool mind, seeing things clearly as they are, knowing things as they really are. Then developing the path, we, we, we no longer linger by creating problems or conditions onto the way it is. We let it go. We learn to stop that. So the more mindful you are, the more you begin to stop creating problems onto the, uh, into the here and now. It's just this way. We remind ourselves. We reflect. We recollect. We remember. This is the way it is. The sound of silence. So we begin to, to that kind of silver strand that goes through everything brings continuity into our life. Suddenly, things are connected. You begin to feel an ease with the way things, with the flow of life, rather than, than with the, the constantly in the th going up and down with the conditions. It's like you've suddenly found a, a strand, or the, the straight way, the way that goes through everything, where everything arises and ceases, where everything is related. And so that one feels in a sense of ease, a sense of well-being, rather than of fear, anxiety and worry. 
because you're abiding in the natural state of the mind, in the stillness, in the clarity of it, in the ease of it, rather than in all the excited uh, extreme conditions that you can create out of it. Now this can actually be witnessed too and de developed in the life of a human being. It's not something that is uh, beyond anyone's ability. You're all here to do this, in fact. The whole purpose of our life would be taking these precepts, the bhikkhus with their patimokha recitation, the, the ten precept nuns, the eight precept anagarikas and anagarikas. Well, it's a sense of commitment to this form in order to help us recollect ourselves, to have the conditions, to choose these conditions to support our life in order to reflect more continuously, more profoundly. Because the kind of neutrality of the monastic life, we're not emphasizing personal qualities, personal differences. There's no class or race or nationality. Uh, the, the differences between men and women are diminished. We're not emphasizing masculinity, femininity. All this, just on the conventional level of what we see and hear, an experience on, on the sensual plane now, say in a, monastery, in a monastery like this, is to simplify, make simple this complex sensual experience. Get it down to, to common agreement on how to relate to each other in a decent way, respecting each other without uh, and causing the least amount of problems and difficulties, so that we can develop this. We can be continuously more, continuously more aware of this strand that goes through everything and abiding there more and more rather than being pulled out into the sensual objects, into the society's problems and the worldly cares and worries that go on and on and on and on and on forever. Life, on the, for a human being, is a worry. It's a veil of tears. And you think of how much crying there is in the human lifespan. How much crying we have to do. How many tears are shed. How hurt we are by life. How much pain and, and disappointment despair we can experience in our lifetime because of this human condition of being a, a sensitive separate individual being like this how, how sensitive it really is uh, a lot of life has to be uh, developed in a way that we, we become desensitized we have defenses and we protect ourselves all the time trying to make sure that we're not going to get hurt by anyone again or that we're safe, physically safe and that everything's going to be all right, hopefully. There'll be no kind of terrorist activities, hopefully, at Amrabati and, and we'll be safe, have enough food and shelter and all this. And we don't want to be hurt emotionally or insulted or taken advantage of or exploited. All these are are possible for us in, in this human existence and to be taken advantage of, to be mistreated, humiliated, rejected, beaten, ostracized, misunderstood, tortured, possibilities we recognize, though fear can haunt us, the fear of having to endure what we, what we feel we could not endure. A 
And because of this sensitivity, always in the sensitive state, in, in meditation now, as a monk and as a nun, we're, we're actually taking off all the defenses. We're making ourselves truly sensitive. This life, if you develop it in the right way, is making you, even increasing your sensitivity, you become much more sensitive. I'm much more sensitive now than I used to be. I used to be, well, I used to, I was quite insensitive when I look back, 20 years ago. The things I used to try to avoid and ignore, and all kinds of defense mechanisms and things that I could just kind of clamp onto a situation to to protect me from being hurt or frightened. And then being a monk, suddenly you find yourself kind of opening up, taking, becoming quite voluntarily taking that step towards total vulnerability. No defenses, no protection, shaven head, Robes can't fight back, have to depend on charity, on alms, have to depend on the kindness of others, can't be independent and self sufficient. Protect yourself. If I could just be independent, self sufficient person, then I wouldn't I wouldn't have to depend on anybody. I could be I wouldn't have to feel that I needed anybody. I could maybe find a nice little place up in the mountains or in Wales or some place where nice little quiet scene with a cabbage patch a little little maybe hut nice little hut or I could live I have a nice maybe a, one of these uh, Swedish uh, wood burning stoves in it keep nice and warm sit in there and not have to cope with anybody at all that might hurt me or upset me or frighten me or ex- demand anything of me. And I wouldn't have to depend on any of you or have to deal with anything with the society but become a kind of hermit. That has a certain attraction actually. <laughs> That's not an unattractive picture. Not that I determined to live in a community because I, I, I couldn't bear not to. Or that I'm an alms mendicant because I'm too lazy to grow cabbages. In fact, I would like to grow cabbages. I like gardening. I like growing carrots and cabbages. And I like cabbage. (laughs) (laughs) But the self-sufficient, independent human being, that's a kind of safety, isn't it? One feels that one feels maybe that might be very protective where your your life you're not taking any risks. You've covered all your moves and you feel safe. Where the monastic life is like not covering anything, just depending solely on faith, on the good heartedness of other people, by living a holy life, a life in which one, uh, say, is living in such a way that people uh, want to draw near to it. For a monastery like this, the monks and nuns, people want to come near to it. Why? Why do they want to come here? Why do they want to take on the take on precepts and live in a cold place like this? <laughs> well, they probably have nice little homes, and cozy.
Now, one thing I found uh, very stifling is coziness. Having everything tied up, secured, and guaranteed, I've always found a, a bit like you can hardly breathe. That living on the edge always is where one is alert. One feels alert and attentive to things. Where you're where you you're taking the risks. You're not trying to, to live this life just to, to have the easiest and safest lifestyle, just to avoid any risks. But one is willing to risk one's life take the risks in life in order to understand and know things as they are so monastic life is based on risk it's a risk it's not a security it's based on on just depending on on what is generous and kind in the society rather than demanding it we're not demanding generosity or expecting it but we 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 have we develop this faith that kindness and generosity there is that in this society which will uh, which will see which will take the opportunity will take see it as an opportunity to be generous and kind helpful and it does work doesn't it people do come forth where they come from, you don't, we don't go around soliciting or recruiting, advertising. It just somehow word gets around, people come and they, what they see, they want to, they, they, something, they have a sense for it. They begin to recognize its value, a longing for the holy life, for spiritual development, for a pure life. For a life that they can respect themselves. They can respect themselves again for living in such a way. And that's, that in itself is a, is a reward, isn't it? To be able to respect yourself. To have a sense of respect for what you're doing, for how you're living your life. Means a lot. Because if we don't have that, then, our, then we all suffer a lot from guilt and depression. If we aren't putting some effort into our lives towards something transcending just physical security and pleasure, what is more useless and meaningless and depressing than just seeking pleasure? I found that really depressing. I tried it for several years, just seeking pleasure, pleasure seeking. And I, and I quite had a good time, actually. It wasn't like that it was a, a rotten time. Pleasure's pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> but it was meaningless. It had, it had nothing. It, one had it when one had enough of it. It was like. You know, one didn't want to, to spend one's life doing that, seeking pleasure all the time. It's all right to try it out, and then, but to have to do it, feel you're compelled to do that forever would be a hell around. Constantly seeking distracting pleasures of the senses is the ultimate boredom. Sometimes people ask me, they say, they're very attached to uh, classical music, refined, genteel English people, or Europeans, they say, quite shocked, you can't listen to Mozart. That's terrible. Mozart is a, is a spiritual experience. Surely the Buddha wouldn't mind a monk listening to Mozart because it's uplifting the spirit. It's 
true art. It's brilliant. It's marvelous. And they go on uh, talking about the the virtues of listening to Mozart, which one doesn't disagree with. One like I like to listen to Mozart myself. <laughs> <laughs> Let me. <laughs> but one gets tired of even Mozart. Steady diet of Mozart. It's pretty wearisome. Having to pay attention to, to that. And then the, the sound of silence, when you become aware of that, you become much more in realize the. Uh, the blissful state of the mind that isn't depending upon the, the strains of Mozart. Even in spite of they have all these electronic uh, inventions now, you can get the best kind of sounds with earphones and portable little cassettes. You can you can hear Mozart wherever you go. You see people walking around London with these earphones on, listening to, I don't suppose it's Mozart. <laughs> I'm afraid to think of what it might be sometimes. <laughs> but where the, the true bliss of the mind, the stillness of the mind, is transcending even the finest sensual experiences, then one turns to that. And it seems to a, to a sensualist as a kind of annihilation of the senses. Because to them, uh, the idea of sensual fulfillment is so important. But the Buddha mind is one that knows that sensual objects are never fulfilling that they, they arise and they cease, they, they, they start and they stop, they begin and end. They wear out tape recorders and hi-fis and stereos and all these, there's always something going off in them, some scratch, some irritate, irritating little thing, the like broken record, where you hear the same violin note over and over, it's upsetting, isn't it? I'm trying to, to try to get the the technology down where you get a flawless recording without any squeaks or burps in it. Now the strand that goes through all that, the stillness, the silence of the mind itself, everything connects to that. Everything arises and ceases there as you begin to abide there more and more, observing, alert, attentive to the way it is. And that is what we call developing the path, the Eightfold Path. Right understanding, right thought, this right understanding is right thinking. You're going to think in the right way rather than just conceptually proliferate out of habit, and f desire and fear. Thought itself is quite useful, a valuable function of mind. Sometimes you might think we're, we're against thinking. But we're, what we're pointing to is the enslavement to thought that has kind of obsessed the minds of Europeans lately. People all over the world, just obsessive thinkers. They can't stop. The mind just goes endlessly on banging away, day and night. <laughs> and it is, it's very wearisome, isn't it? To just have endless the thoughts, just connect one right after another for, a, for the whole day and night. You just have to knock yourself out in sleep. That's why people take all these drugs. I, I don't know what happens like with cocaine, but I imagine it helps relieve that, that kind of obsessive thinking. I can't think of any other reason why you'd want to take it. But, uh, you know, it does kind of maybe 
stop the obsessiveness and the fear, worry kind of things of the mind. But meditation is a, is a much more, is a, it takes effort. You have to develop it. So it has to come from you. It has to come from a real determination in your life, which is something we need, because otherwise we, we'll just become drug addicts if we, if we depend on, on the drugs for this. Just a kind of temporary uh, uh, suppression, temporary kind of uh, change of consciousness, but it leaves us without any wisdom to understand or to know the mind and the way out of suffering. Where this this meditation is real, a thorough examination and witnessing to the mind itself, so that you see so clearly, you know so precisely the way out of suffering, there's not the slightest doubt in the mind. And this ability to reflect using insight, knowledge, into the way things are, allows that to happen. You can actually do that. You can actually be so clear and know so precisely the way out of suffering that there's no more doubt about it. So then you develop that path. Now, when we... In the month of February, the formal retreat ends, the, the, the kind of January hibernation retreat as such. But the practice remains the same. It will be exactly the same one. Reflective, reflecting on the way it is, not lingering on things, turning to the still mind, letting go of the world, living your life here, getting up in the morning, leaping out of bed with alacrity like you've all been so eagerly doing, (laughs) well-disciplined and trained, and uh, that you can continue doing. Whether you're at Chithurst or Harlem or Devon or here, or wherever, the practice is always the same. So what I've been trying to encourage during this retreat is this reflecting ability to develop that through the Four Noble Truths. Dukkha, Samudaya, Niroda Magga, and then to develop the Magga, the path, as you have insight into cessation. You see that point where you you can let things cease, let things cease, allow things to cease, and then live your life, say, in the form, the conventional form of monasticism, so that you, you are not, your life isn't a constant kind of distraction with the world. Because the, the Buddhist monasticism is one where every, the things, even though we have to do maybe distracting things, the whole point is to observe the mind. Even the work projects or anything that, that might be dealing with the worldly conditions is not to is not to say an obstacle towards enlightenment but an opportunity because the whole tenor of our life and spirit of it is this enlightenment seeing things as they really are now that's an escape from suffering but it's it, from wisdom there's no point in, in hanging on to suffering is there we might as well escape it uh, you're just trying to escape suffering. That's what you're doing up there, Damravati. <laughs> Where we, with people, we live in London, and we're we're willing to suffer completely, <laughs> forever. <laughs> Not like you, if you're trying to escape suffering. But then, you know, one realizes that if you're, if you're stuck in the sewer, 
you might as well, if there's a way out, you might as well find it. <laughs> there's no point, is there, in, in the, just spending the rest of your life in the sewer. Uh, even if there's no other way out, then, then just contemplate the sewer and free yourself from any attachment or aversion you might have to it. <laughs> Which might be... <laughs> but when, there's a, when you see that there's a, a better place to go, why not go there? Some place that isn't so painful, so stinking, so foul, so upsetting. So Buddhist monasteries are attempt to offer an alternative to the sewer. <laughs> where the condition the supportive condition so that the monks maybe our intention to to provide out of compassion for the or sentient beings trying to provide opportunities, give occasions. For example, this retreat, the January retreat, was set up by myself, set it up as an opportunity, making the occasion available for this. So that it was, it wasn't set up by you, was it? It was, it was me really that, set, that designed and set up and led the whole thing. So that means you can reflect on it. It's a, since you you don't have any say in the matter, you can just you can you know you just more or less use it for reflection to see what happens. So it was deliberately done in that way. You didn't want a democratic meditation retreat. Where we all say what we want to do during, and have a vote, and that, democracy isn't is isn't is necessary for that. What we need is to have a have some standard to use that we don't that we don't create that we can then we can reflect on our reactions to it and what happens. Because the purpose of the retreat was was solely to give you an opportunity to develop your reflexive mind. Nothing else. For your enlightenment. It wasn't designed to convert you to Buddhism or or brainwash you or or just to as a power trip for myself or anything like that. <laughs> But as a, something that monks can offer, isn't it? we can we can provide occasions. This I realized uh, when I used to uh, contemplate uh, Wat Pa Pong in Thailand. I used to think, why does Ajahn Chah? Why does he bother with all this? Surely, an enlightened man like that must really find it wearisome to have to. Kind of, so many always people coming and going and, and disillusioned monks.